Down this small alleyway off of St. James's Street in London is one of the world's most famous bars, serving one of the world's most famous martinis by one of the world's most famous bartenders. But forgive yourself if you've been walking past it and never known it was here, because it is tucked down not one, but two almost completely hidden alleyways. I'm here today in front of Duke's Bar at Duke's Hotel, which was a favorite of James Bond author Ian Fleming for its ice cold and famously strong martinis. So strong, in fact, that there is a hard limit of just two per customer without exceptions. This place is an institution amongst the well-traveled and well-dressed and is one of my favorite places in London for an intimate, civilized drink. Bartender Alessandro Palazzi is as much a fixture of this famous bar as the martinis themselves. Over my many years traveling to London and the many martinis I've enjoyed at this bar, I've come to know Alessandro as a friend. So I thought it'd be fun to drop inside Duke's bar to visit with my good friend Alessandro and learn what goes in to one of their famous Duke's martinis. Alessandro. Yes, how are you? <laughs> Wonderful uh, to see you. I can't Welcome tell you how back. much I'm enjoying this. I mean, how great to see you in London. Of course, Duke's Bar, it's like almost a second home as much as Davidoff of London or my club. One of the places that I look forward to always visiting. And we're looking forward to seeing yeah. you. So one of the things that's always fascinating me about Duke's Bar is, you know, one, this is a bastion of civility. I mean, everyone's well dressed. Everyone is, uh, you know, elegant and drinking these beautiful cocktails, of course, you're mixing. Uh, but more than that, it's almost a well-kept secret amongst the well-dressed. Uh, I mean, hidden behind two alleyways, completely invisible from St. James's Street. I mean, you would never know it was here if you didn't know to go looking for it. Yes, that's what makes it a little bit different. So we are, we are like a destination. You have to know we are here. Sometimes even black cops, they don't know where it is. <laughs> if you ask, it did happen. Yes, yeah. it did happen. Well, of course, Duke's Bar and you, Alessandro, are famous for the classic gin martini. I mean, there's probably no more famous place in all of the world to drink a martini than here at Duke's Bar, which has made all the more special of just how beautiful and elegant of an ambiance this is and how well-dressed even the people you're sitting amongst are. But the, the, the philosophy, we want to be a club without being a club. Okay. So there's no music, there's no food. We serve some, if people require a canapé, but we offer a complimentary uh, uh, nibble. But there's no DJ, there's nobody. There's no television. No, no, absolutely not, <laughs> no television. Even it's proper. meal of tennis, doesn't matter if a window of time, the television is downstairs in the restaurant. We yeah. don't uh, hear, it's a paradise. Uh, like I said, it's like a club. Obviously, now we become a martini destination. Yeah. Uh, we do roughly about between 300 to 350 a night. Is that right? Indeed, yes. Wow. The different, we create in homage of one of our patrons, Mr. Ian Fleming, different martini. This is what also put us, the bar was already well known. If you think, I don't know if you're aware, Originally, this was a private house. A private it was house. a private house, okay. indeed. It wasn't a hotel. Right. It became Duke's Hotel in 1908. 08. Wow. So over 100 years. Over 100 years, and the bar was only this room. It was quite small. So, But it, for how long the bar has existed since 1908? Oh, since the day one. Day one. But it was only this room where okay. we are now. The counter was a little bit more inside, and there used to be stool all over the place. Okay. 
the old uh, customer, they like to stand up. Here now we do all table service. Yeah. It's, we don't have it many, many. Sometimes, like yourself, you like to stand at the bar and mm -hmm. you're more than welcome. But majority, they sit down. Yeah. And the coincidence, 1908 also, is the year where Mr. Fleming was born. Is that right? Indeed. Okay. Yeah. And so Ian Fleming, of course, the author of James Bond, and someone who is very much no stranger to St. James is, is one of the things that has helped immortalize Duke's Bar, um, you know, for all the ages. And the Vesper, created in his first novel. So Fleming, during the war, was the PA to the Navy commander who was in charge of the intelligence at the time. And like you said, he was very well known in St. James in the club. He was a member of three clubs in St. James. He was put to be the PA to the Navy commander because he was very methodic. Mm -hmm. He was very patriotic. Mm -hmm. The family's father was died in the First World War. The father and mother, they were Scottish. And um, he himself, in the club, when the, the, um, the, the general, I forgot the, 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 the general or the colonel, who was in the Navy, he could trust someone like Flem if anything happened to him. So this is when he offered, in one of the club, he offered to him to be his PA. Okay. Often people confuse he, he, he was a spy, he was not. He was not a spy. He was the PA, but also he managed to give some mission during the war, which they were very successful. Okay. One, they made, I think, a movie called uh, Operation Mince Meat. Okay. That was his idea. All right. But in the first novel, which didn't come straight away very popular, Casino Royale, he created the Vesper. Yeah. But my understanding, I think he created to tell us she's a double agent, because when I graduate from Catering College, as a young bartender with a long, uh, a lot of testosterone, Italian, my English was worse than now. <laughs> if I did a competition in those days, they were very strict. With gin and vodka, you'd be out. Yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. today we are much more open mind, mm -hmm. but also Fleming voluntarily made the martini famous to all of us because we all inside we want to be like Bond yeah. when you read the novel. So people uh, in the old days, the time of Fleming, only the elite would drink cocktail. Mm -hmm. For instance, this bar was only mainly patronized by people in the politics and the army. Yeah. Well, of course, St. James's Street is, you know, from its roots was seated in the upper class. I mean, you've got four of the most important clubs in all of London here on St. James's Street. It's proximity to St. James's Palace, which is, you know, uh, barely a block away from you. This is an authentic bar and that it has been a bar, as you've described, since 1908. 1908. It's been in one of the most prominent and important, you know, blocks of all of London. And if you think things happen, I wish, uh, because not only Mr. Fleming, but uh, for a few years, Sir Winston Churchill used to be around the corner. Of course, yeah. So, like I said, uh, in the before, actually now we have 89 bedroom, but when it started in 1908, there was only 40 bedroom. Is that right? Wow. The rest, they were flat, patronized, small pedata by people in politics yep. and uh, the army. Yeah. And this is why here you have to be. But to give you an idea, London, I came to London as a younger bartender. I couldn't because when I was 17, in 1975, when I first came to London. Really? Imagine if in 1975 I was working at Dukes, okay? Just as, a, as, as an example. Finish my shift and then I decide to go to the Savoy, to the American bar for drink. Yeah. I would be sacked immediately. You were yeah. not allowed. Yeah. And we were brought happy with that mentality. Mm -hmm. When I tell people now, they go, what? But yeah. that time for us, it was quite normal. Yeah. It was different, different, like you said. And I see in the it really was change. a different era. Different era. Here we're trying to be modern, but staying classic. Yeah. Like I said, that's why we don't use the television, as you notice, no DJ. The martin is always classic. Well, there's no, no music. No, no, no. Yeah. The music is by people talking and the noise. Yeah. Um, as Italian, we're very noisy, so you don't need the music. <laughs> well, one of the things I appreciate so much about Duke's Bar uh, is this authenticity. I mean, this is, is in many ways, is as, as much of an institution as John Lobb, Savile Road, German Street, the Piccadilly Arcade. I mean, this has been here since 1908. 1908. And so whenever I step into Duke's Bar, in some ways, it is one of the characteristics I enjoy so much about London and that I feel like I'm stepping back in time to That's a bygone exactly. era. 
Yes. Where there is a decorum. There's a very strictly enforced dress code here. I mean, you won't see anyone in trainers and a hoodie. It's not too loud. It's not crazy, right? There is a civility to it. We, that's what I aim to try. Uh, we want to give a civilized experience to yeah. our people. And that's what we're always trying to do. One of the things I love so much about Duke's Bar is that if it is open, you can almost be certain that Alessandro is here. You're here, your bar staff. Uh, it's not a transient oh, staff. No. The staff no. that has been here has been here forever. Indeed, the two of my colleagues, uh, they've been with me over 16 years. We How long have you been here? 16. 16. Years. 16, yeah. 16 years. So two other people have been with you since, in many ways, the beginning of your tenure here. Indeed, yes. Wow. And then we have uh, two other younger bartenders. One has been now with us over two years since we reopened. Yeah. But he was here working in the restaurant, so mm. we knew him. And then we have, uh, the, the, that would be Claudio, and then we have Emmanuel who just rejoined us. He was here 10 years ago for training. We gave him a little bit of a three months experience. He want to, then we send him to work in different other parts of the world. Now he's back with us yeah. full time. So yes, it's very important that we, we all share the passion. Yeah. We all bartender. We all been born bartender. And Exceptionally we will, professional though. Indeed. We, right. And that's why. And the aim for me is to carry on the legacy our predecessor created for us. And what would you call that legacy though? I know what I would, how I would describe it. How would you describe that? It's the service. It's all about the service and the quality of the drink. Well, That's I would nice. describe it as elegance and, and class. Well, no, because I often explain, it's not just about the drink, it's the experience. And as you know, here yeah, you can conversate and meet other people. I've been very lucky through my career. Yeah, got people got married. I put them together. <laughs> Business. <laughs> yeah, it's well, just that. You're quite understated in this <laughs> regard, Alessandro, because again, one of the things that I appreciate so much is I'm you know, sitting here drinking a martini. Uh, and this is in many ways the crown of my time in London. It's oftentimes how I end up my trip in London is with the martini here. Is you know at any one time, probably 80%, if not more of the people that are here enjoying the privilege of drinking a Duke's martini. At least 80, if not more, of the oh, people yes. that have come here. Indeed, no, 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 we have a very good relation. And this is, like I said, it's a club without being a club. And this is yeah. why you can talk, mm -hmm. you can meet and become friends with some new people. You didn't know you have something in common. And you see a few times you've been here where people come to your table yes. and recognize you and say hello to you. And the, we allow this kind of friendship because you know where they are. If yeah. there was someone I did not know come near your table, I will stop it. Yeah. I will not allow to bother you. Mm -hmm. It's very, very important. It's very important the privacy because I know you come in always at the end of your time in London, yeah. you want to enjoy. Yeah. But we always, not only me, but my team, mm -hmm. make sure if someone approach you, other people we know, well, no, they're not yeah. disturbing. This well. is the most important thing. People say to me, what's the, you know, bartender? It's, it's like a cocktail. And I repeat this is phrase all the time. You need three ingredients for a cocktail. For bartender, you need three ingredients. Diplomatic, acrobatic, charismatic. Mm. Once you got these three things, making drink is actually easy. The difficult one is to conjure all these three. That's the difficult one. And the same what's happened at Dukes or what's there at Dukes. So, Alessandro, I mean, if you've told me that you began your career here, 125 years ago, I would believe it because you, to me, represent what Duke's Bar, at least as an ideal, is. Yeah, one of the things I look forward to the most is stepping through these doors, enjoying this small mecca of civility, and of course, a Duke's Martini. But, but today, I'm going to start, I'm going to do something different. I want to, you to try the Vespa, because you Vespa. normally go for the gin. Mm -hmm. But I want your opinion, what you think, the way I changed the Vespa and the story I will tell you. Please make yourself come to your usual table, ah. and I will come with the trolley. That's an offer I cannot refuse. <sighs> ah, Alessandro. As I was saying earlier, you know, one of my rituals is uh, on my last night in London, and this is how it is we get to know one another, is a uh, dinner at Wilton's, followed by a martini at Duke's. And this is how I end every trip to London. That is spectacular. Well, there's no better well, way, right? Exactly. Um, <laughs> it's 
So we spoke a little bit earlier about, of course, you know, the history of Duke's Bar. I mean, I feel like in so many ways, this is kind of one of the best kept secrets amongst the well-dressed in London. Because it's tucked away back here, in some ways it's hidden in plain sight uh, from, you know, your average person just visiting London. And so uh, it's, uh, you know, an interesting but very well-informed crowd that one finds here. Yeah, Mr. Kemp, we were very lucky. Like you said, we've been eating away and the uh, how majority of our customer are people connected with Savile Row, mm -hmm. like yourself, like you said, well dressed and we we're trying to keep as well uh, our customer to be well dressed. And a lot of the James Bond uh, fans. Yes, of course. Yes. We yeah. also and they also share the same uh, a lot of the James Bond fans I know they also love to dress properly. Mm -hmm. So we are very lucky. We are very lucky we are eating away. Well, it's a very well-dressed crowd here, and I know that the dress code is strictly enforced. Exactly. So what should we start with? I guess, I mean, of course, the famous, you know, drink of James Bond that really was uh, invented here was the Vesper. The Vesper. Uh, let me refrain. Not so much invented here. Fleming wrote in the first novel. Mm -hmm. Here, we kind of change it. Okay. Um, here, when I took over, the first thing I did I recreate a menu in homage to the writer. Even if I obviously I never met him before, uh, because he passed away in 1964. But when people ask me, because involuntary, Mr. Fleming is made the martini famous to us. What people don't realize at the time of Fleming, where in the States you have to only know speak here, easy bar, here cocktail was only drunk by the elite. Mm. No more people would be in the pub drinking beers. But when he created James Bond, and he changed the rules where he drinks vodka. You will never see anybody in the 14th, the 15th UK drinking vodka martini. Martini will be the way we stabilize. Dry, uh, dry, of course, but London dry gin, stir with a twist of lemon. Yeah. And the prime example in the first novel, Casino Royale, he created this cocktail called Vespa, the Vespa. Vespa, Vespa as you know, is a Latin prayer. It's an evening prayer. But my understanding, I, I'm very lucky to have a book about his life and read this novel. The reason why I mix two white spirit is telling us she's a double agent. For instance, when I graduate from Catherine College yeah. as a young bartender with long hair, we <laughs> 100 years ago. A few years ago then. <laughs> I wish, quite, quite a few years ago, I would never, never be able to mix gin and vodka mm. as a cook. Today, luckily, People are much more experimental. And this cocktail actually also became famous with Casino Royale, remake with Daniel Gregg. Yeah. But Daniel says the same recipe from the book. It's not his fault, it's a tiny mistake. Mm. The mistake comes, the ingredients are not there. For instance, he says while he's losing against Le Chief, make me a martini. And first he doesn't call it, he just said to the bartender, where you put half a measure of quinoa lily, one part of vodka, no brand three parts of Gordon's, mm. shake it very well because martini have to be served very cold, spot on Mr. Bond, finish with a twist of lemon. Mm. You will not be able to make this drink. Now, Kina Lille is not available. You may can find in some auction, but it's quite expensive. And uh, you have a Lille Blanc, beautiful vermouth. Vodka, there's no brand, because he only drank vodka in Moscow in 1933. So okay. we are talking different. And the Gordon's gin, of today is not the same gin. Yeah. So my version, which is very important, and what he says, make sure it's very cold, frozen glass. If you touch the glass, as you can see, it's quite frozen. It doesn't look like it, but it is frozen. My version, I put a drop of Angostura bitter to give the color and the bitterness. Now, this is not the French vermouth. This is a vermouth I was very lucky to give an idea to a friend of mine here in London, we own a small micro distillery. We create the dry vermouth and the amber, which is very similar to the French, but everything comes from UK. That was the choice of uh, the sacred distillery. And it works perfect for me because inspired by his cocktail, I can do a different, more modern style. And as you try before, you can drink it. Now the vodka. But I follow his instruction, half measure. Now I'm going to put one part, but this is Polish vodka. It's not Russian vodka. Now, the reason why I want to use this Polish vodka, 
because the real Vespa, the, the, lady, the spy who spied him, it was a young lady called Christine, if I pronounce probably, Starberg. Mm -hmm. She was the first female spy for UK to go over to the enemy during the war. Okay. Christina was Polish. Ah. But not only that, Fleming was mesmerized, not only by her beauty, but she also was Winston Churchill's favorite spy, because during the war, she helped to recruit other spies. And she was beautiful. And she was beautiful. <laughs> they gossiped, they said, they had never lived. I don't know, I wasn't there. Now, the main thing is the gin, number okay. three. Number three is the actual address of Berry Brother, Ian St. James. Berry Brother, as you know, is a very well-known wine merchant. The oldest in the world, I think. The oldest, because the shop, the original shop, number three, is from 1698. But I choose this particular gin because it represents proper London dry gin, six botanical and it's 46 ABV. Okay. So it's got the Vava Vum, but also, they were here before anybody else because it used to be in 1698 a coffee house when this was farmland. Mm. Then here comes the clubs, and Mr. Fleming was a member of three clubs. So that's what I want to use. So the spirit's still here. <laughs> now I see the bottles look very cold as yeah. well, they're frosted. So we keep the glass in the freezer, we keep the vodka and the gin. And the deep freeze. In the deep freeze. And then you see how the. Wow. I mean, it pours like you syrup. See, exactly, that's the idea. Because you see, I don't shake, I don't stir. Now, the reason why you stir a, a cocktail, which is all alcohol, is to cool down. The secret of a cocktail is the temperature. Yeah. Here, there's no dilution. There's no single drop of water. Mm. But most of all, it's, it's something you can let sip it for quite a little while, and it will always stay cold. Now, he finished with the lemon. I'm a rebel, I use an orange. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what's incredible to me about the martini uh, is its purity and its simplicity. The simplicity. But despite not... all those, it, you know, despite it being simple, it is so difficult to execute as you do so masterfully here at Duke's Bar. Thank you. Like you say, it's all about the ingredients. Like I say, it's very important they have to be cold. We choose premium ingredients and also now I use an orange, as you can see, we have a beautiful Malfi lemon, but for this one, the orange, you see the oil, how, mm. now the viscosity allowed this oil to float on top. Now, as you know, the orange, the aroma is sweet, but the oil is not. Also I use orange, orange is one of those aroma who brings memory. Yeah. But you will see, this is normally takes about 20, 30 minutes. Another thing we do at Dukes, we don't give time. Like you say, we could be somewhere so quiet, mm -hmm. we want people to relax. We are club without being a club. Yes. And that's what we Indeed. want to emphasize, the ingredients. And you will see, because when we drink, the nose is the first organ. So you got this beautiful sweet. So you think, is this gonna be a sweet cocktail? And then you, when you sip it, you say, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. And that's the idea. I think this may be my first Vesper at Duke's because my normal drink of choice is the classic the martini. The gin martini. But this is a rare treat. But today I want to do something different for you. And you see the oil float on top. Mm -hmm. Let me smell this. Salute. And now you are James Bond for the time you're drinking this. And you do smell the floral sweetness of the, of the orange. Of the oil. Yeah, well, cheers. The other thing you will see mm. during the experience you drink, how it changed, because wow. at the moment it's very cold. Mm. Obviously it's a little bit warmer. It will get a little bit warmer, staying cold all the time. The oil will go down. Halfway you have another cocktail without mm. us. It's all about ingredients. Well, it's really in some ways deceptive how strong the martinis are here at Duke's because they're so cold and so smooth. You almost forget that you're drinking something that is almost straight you know, gin and vodka. Indeed. In this case. Indeed, it, it is 125 ml of pure spirit. That's why we recommend always to sip it. That's why we don't rush people. Longer longer you take, the more you will enjoy the drink. Absolutely. And, the, and so talk to me about the temperature. I mean, so the bottle, the temperature of the bottles is really important in terms of creating that viscosity. I mean, whenever you pour it, I mean, it looks like you're pouring syrup, in not gin. Uh, and that is that hint, you know, that is that telltale sign that has been not just chilled, but properly chilled. Because that's the secret, people ask me what's the secret, there's no secret, it's all about temperature and ingredients. In the old days, 
but then that we use cheap ingredients. They thought cocktail completely wrong. It's like food. It's Especially if you see the food scene today, people want local ingredients, mm -hmm. they want natural, they don't want any more this layer with the, the 20 different flavor. Yeah. You do not need it. Cocktail is the same. Obviously, cold is very important. So we keep the, the so we have a two freezer. One for the glasses, which is there's no thermostat. It just freeze constantly. Okay. Larger glass, and then we have it for the spirit, which we start at minus 22. That's how cold we keep Minus 22? Minus 22 degrees. Wow. Yeah. That is cold. That's a very so important. So this is yeah. a proper deep freeze. And that's what creates that viscosity that really masks, in many ways, that alcohol. I mean, you don't taste the alcohol in this. It's not alcohol forward. But this is why it also, like James Bond, can be dangerous. Yeah. This is what we recommend. <laughs> that's right. That's why you have to drink slowly. Well, there's That's a very, why... very hard limit, uh, as I hear uh, here at Dukes, of two. two. And the number of times I've, I've had two, I, I can count on less than one hand. And it's always been with a, a little bit of regret the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, well, one of the other things I've come to appreciate so much about you, Alessandro, uh, is, I mean, not just how personable and how nice and kind you are, seeing you work the room is really a marvel to watch because Everyone that walks through these doors, so many of them you know and have developed relationships with over years or decades. But in addition to all of that, you know, how well you really kind of represent the ideal of Dukes, you have one of the most profound understandings of gin of anyone I've ever encountered. So, you know, as we spoke about earlier, I mean, my drink of choice is really that classic Dukes Martini. And one of the things that I've enjoyed uh, over uh, you know my visits and years has been allowing you to surprise me <laughs> with interesting gins versus the classic number three. So I thought you know maybe we could you know I'm not I won't finish this you know for the sake of uh, you know uh, you know people watching this video, but I think it would be uh, you know interesting to see you you know maybe make one of your classic martinis for us with what at this moment you would consider that uh, kind of classic quintessential gin. Indeed, like, thank you so much. Really, really uh, appreciate your comment. This is delicious, though, I have to say. No, I'm yeah, thoroughly we, enjoying this. Yeah, we don't sign contracts, so it's a teamwork. It's not just me. As you know, you know my team. Yeah. And whenever there's a new product, we choose together. And then, like you said, we have a regular customer. They've been coming here before our time. Mm -hmm. I've now been here 16 years. But we got people where they were introduced by their grandparents. They used to come here 50 years ago, 40 years ago. So we're trying to keep the same as you would start by uh, the previous bartender. We're trying to keep the legacy. We carry on. We only change adding. But we, indeed, I'm part of the gin guild. Gin is one of my favorite. I'm well. a bit of a juniper maniac. <laughs> so I want to introduce, like you say, every time you come, we don't have a 300 gin. It doesn't make any sense. We have about 15 gin. And all of them, we know, we've been to the distiller, we know how to explain to people, it's very, very important, we are passionate. Yeah. And the, my team, whenever they make the martini, they don't have to, it's their choice of gin, they will propose. And also, we have a customer, like I did to yourself, where I would like to introduce different gin. As you know, I have a gin from Scotland, mm -hmm. from London, yeah. but even from uh, Colombia, even from mm -hmm. Kenya. And, uh, and I like to introduce it. Yeah. So let me get you something to surprise you today. I think I will surprise you. I have that kind of funny feeling, something <laughs> you never tried. Gin, we are talking. I love a good surprise. Certainly. Just give me a second. Look at the frost on this glass. Mm, beautiful. Have you ever seen this? No, what is this? Uh -huh. This is gin. Mm. And uh, here at, at the bar, I'm very lucky. I have two of my favorite customers, yourself, another gentleman <laughs> called Pilf, Paul Figg. Uh, Paul, of course. I'm sure you know. One of the best dressed of all of show business. The, probably is the best one. They yeah. should give him an Oscar just for the for way he dresses. And yeah. the same to you. When you two are here, for us, it's the benchmark, and it makes us very proud because we see the elegance and other people see, and they're jealous. Not jealous, yeah. but they say, I wish well, I could dress. Yeah, so, like... Paul, a few years ago, uh, like yourself, I kind of ruined his liver during, uh, we know each other for many years, 
give him a different gene, different type of gene. And now he's becoming an expert on gene, mm. and he decided to make his own gene ah, of course. with his mum name. Beautiful. Wow, that's a beautiful label. You know, we were talking about the martini. Yes, originally it was there, bone shaken. Some people say you need a dilution. You don't. The most important for your public, whenever you make martini, is the glass have to be very, very cold. Mm. You don't need these massive glasses because no. it will be get too warm. Yeah. This is contain 125 ml, 12 yeah. centiliters, yeah. which is perfect. And that's one of the things I've always appreciated. There's, there, there's an elegance to the small glass. I mean, the martini glass is an elegant shape, but if it's too large, it just becomes unwieldy, it becomes unbalanced, you're gonna spill it. Exactly. You're gonna but this it. is the perfect size. And it's the size, because you think it's small, but it's 125 ml. It's a perfect glass, you don't want, but it looks small, but it's not. Yeah. Were yeah. these made just for Dukes, I mean? No, no, you can buy them. Yeah. You can buy it in UK, and again, for your public, there's someone in the States using the name. Those are fake. Okay. This is a made What by, is the name on these? Uh, John Jenkins. John Jenkins. John Jenkins. And they're called Chantilly. You can buy online mm. from John Jenkins. Don't buy in Amazon, which is a Dukes. It's not ours. Yeah, well, we should list these on KirbyAllison.com. Thank you. We mm. could call the Kirby. And now, the, earlier on, as I was explaining, yes, Martini originally was there. Obviously, they didn't use the freezer. Here, Dukes, my predecessor, uh, they decided to do it on the trolley. He spy as well, I believe, from the Harris Bar in Venice, where he would prepare before and then put in the freezer. Yeah. It's different. Here, when I came, I created an English vermouth, like the other, the amber, uh, lemon from Amalfi. We carry on adding today flavor as mm. well, because as you know, in London, anyway, you have to go with, yeah. the, with the time. And we're very lucky to get certain product. The gin, new gin, uh, Paul launched about a couple of years ago, it's not, it's not as powerful as it's number three. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is perfect as well to start with. Mm. This is a gene, if you, uh, like I said, the ABV is about 44. Okay. But so you don't feel proper. it. You don't feel it, 44. Well, one and time I think you served me at 52 or something. What was? 50. 50. But it was just you to try, yeah. yeah. The, 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 this is, uh, it goes back to your interesting, you know, you know, library gin. of gins you have back there. <laughs> And you see, the frost left, but it's always cold. So That's cold, the most yeah. important thing. Mm -hmm. is that the, the vermouth, again, same uh, distillery from Sacred, high gauge. This is for two years, it was only for us. Okay. And then I told him to sell it when he won the award, the best vermouth in the world. <laughs> it's 21.8. I just put a few drop. Now, this is quite controversial because some people like what I do. Some people think I'm completely going banana. What I do, I stir. So normally, today, it's very fashionable when you, if you see, when you mix in the mixing glass, mm -hmm. you flavor the ice with the vermouth and then you throw away everything. Yeah, I do it better without it. What I do, I stir and then I shake in the carpet. It's becoming my touch, <laughs> yes. but most of all, I actually, as you can see, mm -hmm. flavor. That's why we bought a 21.8. All the botanical from UK include the wine. Yeah. Beautiful, exactly. beautiful wine. And then, again, the same ritual from the freezer. And you see the viscosity. I mean, it really is just something to see that poured. It's like honey. But, uh, and then I finish with an organic lemon from Amalfi. You will see something so simple, how it's incredible. And again, it's all about the quality. It's back to your Italian can... root, Alessandro. Indeed, <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> it's like Italian food. Oh, wow. So the first thing I did when I took over 16 years ago, I've been looking for the perfect man, and I was luckily to Dukes to be able to introduce here. These are directly from Amalfi. You see the oil? My goodness. Now you have a different experience, because the first thing come to your nose is the, oil, the, the, the aroma of the lemon. And I'll I can't bring you- how, how oily that yeah. is, that's amazing. So I'll bring you to Amalfi without taking you to the airport, without checking your luggage. Wow, well. That looks incredible. I'm gonna push this Vesper out of the way for this incredible Arting Your stall. usual. This is my usual. The gin. And you know what I love about this classic Duke's gin martini, again, goes back to the simplicity and the purity. It is, in many ways, a very simple drink. A little Please. bit of vermouth, hardly any. 
a great gin, in this case, a fantastic gin, and the proper lemon brought from your country, Italy. Indeed, from Amalfi. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it's, it's, and the same, like the Vespa, you see how it changed off way. Mm. When the oil of the, the, the lemon will go down. And it's quite important that the aroma, you know, like I said before, when we drink, this is the first organ, yeah. so aroma is very important. When I was a young bartender, I used to spend unusual minutes trying to make a twist to impress, thinking the twist it was a decoration. No, it's not. Martini's got three ingredients. Some people don't agree with me. They just think it's vermouth or gin or vodka. For me, it's vermouth, gin or vodka, lemon or olives. It yes, works better with the, le the lemon. Some people like olives, we give olives. We use, as you can see from uh, Sicily, yeah. the nocellara. But because it's frozen, the lemon works better. Is there anything you do to prepare the lemons, or are they just that amazing? No, that's it. We're uh, the, very lucky to get from the supplier, who is based here in London, yeah. and uh, they actually own the farm. Wow. So this is an uh, endeavor in... And is this is like a cousin you have clipping those, or like, you know, I mean, these are so incredible. If you told me your mother was picking them from your garden, I'd believe you. I wish I had a garden with this. I really wish. No, yeah. no, they come directly from Amalfi. And uh, I was there a few weeks ago in Naples to do some uh, uh, takeover. And then I'd be very lucky to go to the state to see where it is. Uh, well, Alessandro, I mean, this is incredible. It's so much of what I look forward to in London. Cheers to you. Cheers to everything you do for quality, craftsmanship, and tradition, and for helping uphold the standards here in London. This is truly one of the things I look forward to so much, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kirby. Wonderful to see you again. Wow. Well, here we are at Duke's Bar uh, in Duke's Hotel, hidden behind two alleyways off of St. James's Street in London, the Duke's Martini. Truly one of the best martinis in the world, made it one of the most famous bars in the world by, in my humble opinion, what is without question, one of the best bartenders in the world, Alessandro. Now this is without question, one of the things that keeps me coming back to London. What they do for quality, for craftsmanship tradition, cannot be overstated. So. Cheers to all of you, cheers to the well-dressed, and cheers to Alessandro in Duke's Bar. Ah, delicious. <laughs>